Okay, well, we will go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Dana Knowles. I am Vice President for Grow Business here at the Greater Tallahassee Chamber of Commerce. Um, again, we are excited to come to you today um, in the second of four of our business recovery series um, and excited that Andrew and um, Katie can um, join us today and share their expertise with you. Um, but first, just want to um, say thank you, a big thank you to our sponsors, um, Leon Cares and Capital Health Plan. Um, I know that um, we have Stacy Hammond on the line with us from Capital Health Plan, and I am going to turn it over to her to tell you guys, give you guys a little bit of update about what's going on at CHP. Stacy. Hey everyone, I'm excited to be here with you today and I'm looking forward to today's program. My name is Stacy Hammond and I'm part of the sales and account management team for Capital Health Plan. On behalf of all of us at Capital Health Plan, I'd first like to say that we hope that you are staying safe during this ongoing unprecedented time. We also want to remind you how critical it is to continue the following, um, to continue following the CDC guidelines with things like practicing social distancing and wearing a mask in public. Unfortunately, flu season is upon us. Um, this year is a little scarier than normal, but there are precautions that you can take um, to keep you and your family safe from COVID and the flu. One major thing that you can do is get your flu shot. The CDC recommends that you receive the flu shot by the end of this month to get the most benefit out of it. Additionally, CHP is waiving co-payments for care provided virtually through telehealth to make it uh, easier for you to access uh, care and also make it affordable to you and we're extending that waiver through March 31st of 2021. Telehealth enables members to utilize online services to avoid unnecessary in-person contact. Um, it's especially important during flu season and also right now amid the continuing COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as the only local and trusted health plan right here in Florida, um, in the Florida Panhandle, we are proud to be uniting force uh, with the community by providing excellent service, and we aim to keep people healthy. It's interesting that this time of year brings another important season in the area of public health, determining your healthcare needs as an employer. We're pleased to be able to offer new health plan options to better serve our local employers during these unprecedented times. These um, plan options include extended telehealth services, prescription drug coverage, and more, for more information on our new health plan products, call our sales and account management team or visit us online at capitalhealth.com. As we continue through these tough times together, we here at CHP are here to help. So we wish you and your family the best. Stay safe and stay healthy. And thank you for letting us be here today. Thank you, Stacy. Um, also, we have a secondary sponsor, Leon Cares. Um, so I know that many of you um, have hopefully been able to take advantage of um, some of the Leon Cares um, funding and grants that have been pushed through in our community um, for the last several weeks um, through small business grants, personal grants, nonprofit, um, and we are uh, excited and thankful that um, this this funding has been in our community and that we are able to bring programs like this to you guys um, because of that. So um, thank you to Leon Cares and thank you to Capital Health Plan for um, their support of today's program. And we will go ahead and jump in. Um, Katie, I am going to stop share. So you guys, you and Andrew can um, pop up your information and we will get going today. Perfect, good morning, everyone. Um, excited, excited to be here with you, Katie and I both are, and we're looking forward to the discussion of uh, how to leverage your CPA and bookkeeper uh, through the good times and bad. We'll go through uh, numerous items today, including how to uh, navigate your financial statements, the key things to look for uh, when reviewing your balance sheet, income statement, and statement of cash flows, uh, as well as some communication tips with either your in-house bookkeeper, uh, external bookkeeper, or your CPA. So uh, we're looking forward to, to uh, having this time with you guys today and talking about what we love to do. So uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I know you're not here to hear the personal life of Andrew Gay, but I uh, always want to share some, uh, shed some light on just the personal background. As you can see, uh, CPA here at Grimsley and Company CPAs, we specialize in business uh, and, and personal tax, as well as uh, consulting and, and then uh, campaign finance. And so 
uh, that's our bread and butter. That's what we focus on every day. We take pride in uh, changing people's financial picture for the better. We enjoy uh, our daily conversations with clients on how to navigate the various issues, whether it's, of course, this unprecedented pandemic and the things that come along with that, or uh, in normal times when the economy's going well and, and uh, looking to make decisions uh, within your business that way. So uh, I won't uh, read all the various things about me on the screen. You can see those and read those. But uh, again, that just kind of gives you some some of my interests, uh, as well as some organizations I'm involved with, including our great uh, Chamber of Commerce, who's providing this program to you today. So always excited to participate in the Chamber anytime we can. All right, good morning. My name is Katie Lilly. I'm the owner of Lilyfield Accounting Solutions. We are a outsourced bookkeeping firm who specializes in doing all the uh, full service bookkeeping for small businesses and nonprofits here in town. Um, on November uh, 1st, we'll be celebrating our four year anniversary. Um, and we uh, utilize the power of cloud accounting with using QuickBooks Online um, to be able to do that. I uh, have an accounting degree from both Florida State and University of Virginia, and I was a former CPA back in the day um, not doing tax like Andrew, I was on the audit side, um, but after having three kids, I decided to take time uh, to raise them and, um, and decided I really liked being on the side, not the audit side, but the side that was actually doing the books. And so that's kind of how I ended up uh, creating this firm. And so Andrew and I work a lot together um, because my firm doesn't do any tax. Um, and oftentimes he'll get tax clients um, who really need to be outsourcing that bookkeeping. So he and I have a really great working relationship. And so we're really excited to be able to present this, um, uh, this material to, to you today. So just to give you a quick idea of what we're going to cover, the first thing we're going to do is look at the differences between your CPA and your bookkeeper. Sometimes people get confused as to which person they should be going to for which questions. So we're gonna go into that just a little bit. And then we're gonna let you know how uh, some, some ways of knowing if you're maximizing that relationship with your CPA and your bookkeeper. We're gonna talk a little bit about COVID-19 and how your CPA and your bookkeeper helped you through that. And then we're gonna dig into reading financial statements and then uh, some cash flow projections and how you can look at those cash flow projections going into the new year and helping you through that. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have time for questions. So how do you know if you need a CPA, an accountant, or a bookkeeper? The best analogy that I've found for that is that your CPA is considered like your doctor. So they're the specialist that's gone for years and years um, to school to learn the material that they, they need to do. And so they're, they're at the very highest level. Your accountant is uh, akin to a physician's assistant and your bookkeeper would be considered your nurse. Um, so the nurse being the person that's in there on the day-to-day -day basis taking care of all the details. And they may have a broad um, knowledge of everything accounting, but not necessarily a very specific and specialized knowledge like a CPA would. So I'm going to kick it over to Andrew to talk a little bit about, a little bit more about the CPA role and why you would contact a CPA or use a CPA. Sure, yeah. Thanks, Katie. So uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, some of the qualifications, of course, uh, we, in order to get our designation, we have to pass a very uh, strenuous exam. We do have uh, continuing education requirements. Uh, and then of course, uh, the preparation and, and signature on your tax return uh, would typically come from a CPA. There are uh, other preparers out there of tax returns that may not have our designation as a certified public accountant. And so you always, depending on the complexity of uh, the transactions uh, and the nature of your business, you wanna be mindful of uh, who you are having uh, engage you on these various topics and, and, and advising you uh, on a on a day to day basis or a quarterly basis uh, in regards to the decisions you're making within your business. So the things we focus on, uh, of course, are uh, the tax preparation, 
as well as in-depth tax planning. Those are uh, services that are the bread and butter of what a tax professional uh, certified public accountant would provide. And so uh, we are now uh, have made it through the October 15th deadline. So hopefully uh, all of you uh, got your personal tax returns filed by that deadline. It has been a, a crazy year, of course, due to the pandemic. Uh, but now we are entering the time uh, moving into November and December where it is the opportunity to uh, engage your uh, CPA, talk about uh, tax planning, uh, and get an indication of where you sit for 2020, as well as uh, what the projections are moving forward for hopefully a great uh, 2021 year. So uh, the high level uh, uh, strategy uh, certainly needs to happen uh, and, and the discussions need to happen this time of year with your CPA. And you can have confidence if they have that designation uh, that you know they are giving you prudent advice based on the standards in which we're held. So your accountants and your bookkeepers, they're part of, they're, um, they're members of your day-to-day -day or monthly team. So oftentimes, especially if you're a small business owner or you just started your business, sometimes the, that accounting and bookkeeping role falls on you. And you as the owner are the ones in there creating these daily transactions. Um, after a while, as you grow, you may bring on, you may either hire a part-time bookkeeper or you may have an office manager and you ask the office manager to start doing the bookkeeping for you. Um, or you may, uh, you may have enough volume that you've actually got to hire a bookkeeper as a full-time employee. So there's, different, there's definitely different roles um, that they may play or how they may be in your organization based on the size of your organization and uh, the volume of transactions. But they're going to be the ones that are in there and know your business like the back of your hand. Sometimes your bookkeeper knows more about you than your spouse because they are seeing all the transactions as they come in. Um, so they're recording your daily transactions. They're recording your payroll. They're paying your bills. They're reconciling your statements, um, your sales tax, your 1099s. Um, and, but an accounting degree isn't necessarily required. So usually at the account at the accountant designation, they will have some type of accounting degree or accounting classes or just years and years of, of experience. And your bookkeepers may or may not um, have an accounting degree at all. So you kind of want to look at that when when you're hiring or when you're looking um, for filling that role in your organization. But uh, so. One thing I wanted to point out is that um, just like you wouldn't go to a heart surgeon if you had a sore throat, you're not going to go to your CPA to do your bank reconciliations because you'll be paying CPA prices to do something that an accountant or a bookkeeper is perfectly capable of doing. So that's kind of why I wanted to use this analogy um, because uh, there's, there's many different types of accountants. And, and usually when I tell people I'm an accountant, the first thing they say is, ooh, tax season. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not really into tax. You know, I, it's, it's like uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't go to a cancer specialist if you were gonna have a baby, you'd go to the obstetrician. So there's different, different types of accountants and different roles that they, that they play. So I'm going to have, um, I'm going to kick it over to Andrew um, to tell us how you guys can maximize this relationship with, um, with your CPA. And you talked about it a little bit already with how this is like the best time of year to be actually reaching out. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Katie. So um, uh, to kind of reiterate what I went into earlier, you know, we want to, uh, you know, use uh, the relationship with your CPA to think big picture. We are in tax planning season. Hopefully we're doing that throughout the year. We do have the opportunity, uh, if you are a business owner or an individual where you're not having proper withholding on your wages or your income, that we do uh, have estimated tax payments, uh, the opportunity to make those throughout the year. So uh, if you do have a large tax obligation year to year and you aren't set up on that, that is something you may wanna consider. But in addition to that, we also want to sort of fine tune the financials working with your accountant or bookkeeper that's in-house, or uh, if it's all there at your uh, CPA firm, then we do want to uh, take this time to really fine tune the financials, help you understand what is going on and occurring in your business throughout the year. 
Are you making money? Are you losing money? Uh, are you are you stagnant? Uh, those are all things we can identify in the story that your financials tell. Every every financial statement has a story to tell. It's just a matter of being able to interpret what is there and then be able to uh, communicate that, uh, whether that's to your internal staff, to your uh, executive committee, uh, to your board, whatever uh, it may be, depending on the size of your organization. And then also having some forward thinking thoughts on where those financial statements may take you in the coming years. So in addition to thinking of the now, we want to compare to the past, the previous year comparisons to identify what type of changes are occurring. Are we is our revenue going up? Our expenses going up? Uh, what 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 is transpiring over uh, the previous years compared to this year? But in addition to that, we also want to project the future, right? So we want to understand uh, what is going on, what should take place, what things are occurring in the future in your business or in your industry or with the economy that could impact you one way or the other. And so having a plan uh, for that is part of the communication with your CPA. Uh, that is very important. And so those types of conversations should be going on. We uh, at our firm pride ourselves in having those throughout the year, not just one time a year uh, when we do your return. And so that's something that we uh, really are proud of and, and take pride in. Uh, but those are the ty types of conversations you should be having. And one thing too, to piggyback on uh, Katie's previous slide that I just wanted to bring up, we don't really have a slide here today for this, but it's in regards to internal controls. One of the things we want to uh, always consider, we may have the best in-house accountant uh, or office manager or bookkeeper that's handling our day-to-day -day, um, transactions. But uh, I know Katie can attest to this. I mean, if we are all handling things above board, then we have no problem having internal controls in place on both sides of the equation so that uh, the bookkeeper or accountant can be protected as well as the business owner. And so just don't assume because you've handed over the keys to your most important asset in your business, your financials, your bank account, uh, all the things that ultimately drive you being able to employ people, right? Which is very important, people's families, jobs, lives at stake uh, in regards to business owners that are employing people, that's a great thing. But we wanna take that seriously and make sure that we've got internal controls in place that don't just assume that maybe my in-house accountant or anyone else ha has sole access to an account and that there's no accountability there. So that's very important. If you have further questions on that, we can take those at the end, or you can reach out to Katie and I after this to talk about maybe some internal control procedures that you should have in your business, because that is a very important aspect. And again, one that, um, that most or all accountants uh, should understand and prioritize and so uh, we want to make sure that we've got those types of procedures in place. So um, on the next slide, uh, Katie's going to kind of go through, uh, you know, the relationship with your uh, bookkeeper, whether it's uh, external or internal. Thanks, Andrew. So what I wanted to do was kind of, um, it's been my experience that a lot of times uh, once a business owner has hired a bookkeeper and they've got that in place, they're like, oh, phew, okay, that's taken care of. I don't need to do that. I can completely concentrate on my business now. And they're off to the races, you know, uh, making their business grow, et cetera. And they don't necessarily know what their bookkeeper is back there doing. So what I wanted to do was just um, give you uh, some, some tips and guidelines, and, and they may even be um, internal controls as well, um, so that you know that your bookkeeper is staying on top of things and that they're not just back there doing their thing. The first is that you want to ensure that all bank accounts and all credit cards are reconciled and reviewed monthly. So ideally, the, uh, the bank statement and the bank reconciliation would somehow get to you, whether it's paper or electronic, would get to you as the business owner or the manager of whoever's doing that procedure to be reviewed. And you want to make sure there aren't any unusual outstanding items um, sometimes I'll, I'll get bankrupts that have outstanding checks from 2017 on it, um, which should have been caught. And, um, and then you also want to just glance through the bank statement or the credit card statement for any unusual transactions. And if you're doing that on a monthly basis, you're going to, you, if something is going on, you're going to catch it. <clears throat> um, 
And then you want to make sure that your financial reports are being prepared at least monthly. So these two steps together are going to ensure that your bookkeeper is staying up to date with transactions and not falling behind. So if they're not able to reconcile, your bank statements drop on the first or the second of the month, the first or second business day of the month. So that statement comes in, your, your bank account should be reconciled no later than the fifth business day of the month. Now, if it's not, or you aren't receiving financial reports in a timely manner, that's the opportunity to have the discussion with them. It could be they have too much on their plate. It could be that um, you know, you've know you added these duties to the office manager who over time, their duties have grown um, and they're doing HR and they're doing IT and they're, they're doing purchasing and they just don't have the time to get that information to you, which would be an indication that it's time to split those jobs and perhaps get somebody else on board um, because you're growing and that's a good thing. Um, so, or it could be an indication that someone's back there taking a salary and not necessarily getting the work done. So th that would be two indicators for you as business owner to know what, to just hold them accountable to what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and like I said, uh, really anything should be closed no later than the fifth to the 10th day of the month, um, depending on the size of the company. There are so many things that are automated now um, that and they're either online or they're automated. Um, and that has sped up the time, the amount of time necessary to close. If your bookkeeper is habitually um, taking 15 to 20 days to close, you may want to have a conversation with them and see whether they are still doing um, some outdated processes um, where they are pulling data down from their accounting system into an Excel spreadsheet and manipulating an Excel spreadsheet somehow um, to be able to provide some kind of report. Um, and it's more than likely that that process can now be automated, but it just, we're all guilty of this where we, we've always done it a certain way and it works and we're under time pressure. So we don't wanna take that time to look and see if there's a better way. So if you're not getting those reports by the fifth to 10th um, day of the month, it's probably time to just have a conversation and to, and to really look at why that isn't happening. The last one I wanted to bring up was just working your accounts receivable for collections. And this is gonna tie into cash flow that we're gonna get into a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but I always like to give everybody my little tips on um, collecting cash. So when you send out your invoices to your customers or your clients, those invoices usually go to one of two places. They're either going to a large accounts payable department or they're going to a bookkeeper like yourself um, or like one of your staff members who is... Um, putting that in the system and then deciding which ones to pay. Either way, if it's a huge department or just a one-man show bookkeeper, what they're gonna do when they get that invoice is they're gonna look at the due date. And then they're gonna put it in a folder or into the system based on that due date and they're gonna pay based on that due date. So one mistake I see is that people don't put a due date on their invoices. So you wanna make sure you always have a due date on there and then you want to stick to the due date, okay? Because if you're not, if you're not sending reminders when people are late, what they will do is they will put your invoice continually at the back of the pile or the back of the list. So they'll say, oh, they never call me about this uh, particular invoice. So I'll just, I can hold on because I don't have the cash flow to pay this right now. But if you get, if you have your bookkeeper, um, on the, on the 25th of every month, send out reminders to everybody that hasn't paid, then that accounts payable, accounts payable department or that bookkeeper knows, oh, if I don't pay this one, they're gonna be calling, I'm gonna get an email from them. So you've really gotta be the squeaky wheel to ensure that the cash is always coming. Especially when cash, when cash flow tends to tighten up in economies, um, sometimes small businesses are, they just don't have the cash flow to pay all the invoices at one time. So
So if they've got $5,000 to pay invoices, they're going to look through the invoices and they're going to pay the ones that they know they don't want to deal with that person calling or emailing them. So those are just some tips on, that I wanted to pass along to you because sometimes people just don't, don't know how, how that's working and that it's a really easy way to um, start bringing in your cash flow or tightening up your cash flow or your incoming receipts. Um, so I just wanted to pass that on to you. Okay, so, and of course, there's a ton of other tips I could give right now, but in the interest of time, we're going to move on to something that we're all familiar with, which is COVID-19. So we're going to, I'm going to kick it over to Andrew to talk about um, maybe some of the ways uh, your CPA should have or did help you out during, um, during the pandemic. Sure. Thanks, Katie. So this was a uh, very uh, obviously uh, trying, unprecedented time that we've been through. Uh, the uh, Department of Treasury uh, and the SBA and uh, Congress have, uh, you know, had to make some quick actions uh, and sort of filled in the details later. And we're continuing to get those details now. So hopefully uh, you have had a conversation with your CPA by now. Uh, in regards to the uh, pay Paycheck Protection Program, the loans associated with that, uh, as well as the EIDL loans that were available. Um, you know, the expectation and the um, uh, expectation within our firm was that we did want to make contact with our clients, inform them, make sure that they are educated about this process, work with them to get the proper documentation to obtain that loan. And uh, now we've moved into... Um, the forgiveness time and forgiveness period. And so uh, hopefully you have been uh, tracking that information with your payroll, uh, numerous factors going on there. You have a eight week or a 24 week forgiveness period. The 24 week uh, forgiveness period is the one that we've highly uh, recommended to our clients unless there's an extenuating circumstance uh, in which we uh, should not uh, be looking at that. So uh, obviously the more uh, time that we can take with our covered period the more opportunity um, that we will have to um, uh, have the numbers to obtain forgiveness. And so uh, some things that are still out there right now, uh, just as kind of a quick PPP update before we go to the bookkeeping side. Uh, one is that um, we're still waiting for guidance uh, in regards to a few of the rumors out there. The AICPA has uh, pushed uh, heavily on the Department of Treasury and the con in Congress uh, to uh, have a blanket forgiveness at a certain threshold at that right now, what everybody kind of is operating off of is that hopefully at some point, uh, $150,000 or less, if you've got a PPP loan in that regard, uh, or in that amount that you would, uh, obtain uh, blanket forgiveness. I always tell people though, until it's signed on the dotted line and is, um, issued, we don't need to uh, necessarily expect that, but we do need to keep that in the back of our mind. Uh, recently, the SBA also issued a one-page um, concise uh, forgiveness application for uh, PPP loans, $50,000 or less. That is out there right now. And so if you are under that $50,000 threshold, then that could be an easy uh, one-pager uh, application for you to fill out, communicate with your bank. The financial institutions are doing a great job of communicating with the SBA. Most of them have direct contacts and are getting uh, the information as soon as it comes out to um, identify, you know, the steps they need to moving forward. But it's going to be have to be a patient process. We're going to have to be patient throughout this. Uh, even once you've applied for forgiveness, when we do get to that point, um, we're going to uh, still have some lag time with the backlog that the SBA is having, as well as the financial institutions. So let's give everybody grace uh, in this process, but let's also um, uh, make sure now would be sort of the time to start pulling the information together, communicating with the financial institution once you've gotten past your 24-week cover period, even if they tell you to hold off, which is not a, a bad thing right now, uh, you know, to see what transpires if you don't want to go through those hoops and you're under the 150000 and you're hopeful if you want to wait a few more weeks, that's fine. But let's, let's open the communication line with our banker, with our CPA, with our internal accounting team, and so that you know that you've got the proper reports pulled, ready to go, so that uh, when the time does come to apply, whether that's now or if you decide to wait, 
then you've got that information uh, prepared. So uh, we may have some more questions in regards to PPP that we can answer at the end. Uh, happy to do that. Uh, that's obviously a hot topic right now uh, in the country, in the, in the uh, business and sole proprietor world. So, um, and then now uh, Katie's going to kind of go through, you know, uh, what are the items that your bookkeeper could have helped you with um, and can help you with now in the forgiveness process. So again, going back to my previous slide where I talked about um, the, is your bookkeeper staying up to date? This is a perfect example of why that is so important. So when those PPP loan applications first came out, it was almost a feeding frenzy. And if you were sitting around waiting for your bookkeeper to close because they were three or four months behind, then that was probably that was a problem and that may have kept you from getting these funds. So you want to make sure that the accounts are current and reconciled and that they can print those reports at the tips of their fingers. So when if the if the forgiveness applications dropped on a Monday, were they able to print you the the requisite payroll reports and the PL for the right time period? Were they able to do that um, for you quickly and accurately with, with confidence in the numbers and that they were correct? Or were they scrambling and working 12-hour days trying to get that information? to you. Um, so you want to kind of look at that. And again, that just goes back to what I was talking about previously and having some level of review on a monthly basis to hold them accountable. So should something like this happen in the future, um, you're able to do that in a timely manner. So what we're going to do next is um, we're going to we're going to help you. Um, we keep talking about looking at the financial statement. And most business owners are really, really, um, they understand um, the P&L. That's the favorite financial statement of all business owners. You know, what does the P&L show? And so what Andrew wants to do first is talk about the often overlooked balance sheet. Um, the balance sheet is my, um, is, is the report I always go to. I can pull a balance sheet when I get a client, when I onboard a client, and usually the clients I, I onboard either haven't had a bookkeeper um, for months or the owner's behind and, and just ready to pass it off. I can print a balance sheet and I know exactly where all the problems are. So, um, so I'm gonna have Andrew kind of go through what to look for when you're looking at a balance sheet. Sure, thanks Katie. So uh, now to the exciting part of the presentation, right? Going through <laughs> the uh, financial statements and the numbers, but uh, but really, as a business owner, uh, this is one of the most important documents uh, of your business, uh, components of your business that uh, you need to understand. And I always tell people, you know, the education process sometimes can be long, depending on your background and understanding these. And I know that, um, you know, that, that business owners, for the most part, depending on what industry they're in, they want to focus on what their daily tasks are, as opposed to things like this. But the critical information that's found in these financial statements, like I said earlier, every financial statement uh, has a story to tell. And, and if you're not telling that story uh, or you're not having the data to be able to tell that story, then you're going to have substantial impacts to the decision making process in your business. You cannot make appropriate decisions without knowing that you're looking at good and accurate financial information. And so, uh, although the, the big sexy financial statement for everyone is always the profit and loss statement. I always tell people the most important financial statement for you to have correct in your business is the balance sheet. And the reason why is because the profit and loss statement is just a function of the balance sheet. Okay. So we always want to make sure uh, that, uh, and Katie and her team do a great job of this too. And, and, and we do here at our uh, firm as well in making sure that our balance sheet items are tied out. So as you can see, uh, if, if, if I've got, uh, a stray account like undeposited funds or some uh, account that I'm not sure what those dollars are made up of, odds are that it's a misclassification and therefore it's either uh, responsible somewhere, it, it needs to be put somewhere else on the balance sheet, but regardless, any errors on the balance sheet are going to impact my P&L and therefore I'm not going to see my true profitability as a company. So it's very important We'll start at the top to understand that my checking and savings accounts, as Katie was referencing previously, 
are reconciled, okay? It does not work like a lot of people run their personal checking accounts, which is I sign into my bank online and I look and see that I've got $1,000 in my personal checking account today. Therefore, I can go out and buy that $1,000 TV at Costco that I wanna purchase. It doesn't work like that because what you're not considering is the checks you have written outstanding, maybe the uh, deposits that, uh, or checks that you've collected that week yet to be deposited. All those things factor into your checking account balance. And so, of course, as Katie mentioned previously, we want to make sure that those bank accounts are getting reconciled, uh, you know, on a monthly basis so that we know uh, that our cash on hand is correct. And, and oftentimes use, you know, just your gut feeling. I always tell business owners, you you are in it day to day to know if I'm showing that I've got $150,000 in the bank as this uh, balance sheet is showing, but I feel like, you know, I'm struggling to make ends meet week to week. There may be something going on that may uh, be an error in my balance sheet that's, that's inflating my cash, for example. Okay. So, or maybe I'm not reconciling. So, you know, you as a business owner know your business better than anyone else. And it's, um, important for uh, you to apply sort of your gut feeling to some of this too, to talk about your, uh, this with your bookkeeper, your CPA, your, your in-house accountant, so that you can uh, make some sense of what you're looking at. Uh, of course, running through your fixed assets, uh, we always want to make sure that um, any um, equipment, furniture, um, um, vehicles, and you know, all those sorts of things that are captured that are, that are business related are on the balance sheet. That uh, and and then and then uh, for GAAP or tax basis financials is going to affect uh, accumulated depreciation. Uh, so that's something important. If if I've only got um, you know fifteen thousand dollars of furniture, fixtures, and equipment in my business, and I look and I see that you know it's showing I've got seventy five thousand dollars in equipment, then wait a minute, we've got a problem here. And and the other reason why this is important that costs uh, people uh, money, specifically tax is related to the uh, local tangible tax return. And so that's one of the first things we do when we review a tax return for someone, when they bring in um, their tax return, we wanna look and see what type of fixed assets they have on the books. The reason that's important is because if you're over $25,000, for example, in tangible assets in Leon County, uh, then you are being assessed a tangible property tax on that and your uh, tax preparer is most likely filing that for you every year when they do the tax return. And if there are items on that list, a computer from 2001, for example, and we're in 2020, the odds are you are probably not using that anymore. And that's something that we can scrap, we can remove from the books that will uh, save you on your tangible tax uh, return that you file for the next year. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, we'll move uh, to the uh, liability section. Uh, as you can see, sort of scanning down uh, the current liabilities. If I've got a credit card um, and I'm not reconciling that, the, I've seen these numbers, you know, fluctuate substantially that can severely impact um, the numbers that you're looking at. So we want to make sure that, you know, in this case, I've got a $40,000 balance on my credit card. If I paid that thing off three months ago and I think there's only about $5,000 on uh, my credit card now, then I've got a problem, right? We've got to go back in reconcile, make some adjustments to account for that, uh, as well as going into things like uh, my auto loan uh, or my payroll liabilities, uh, as well as you can see there, COVID-19 PPP funding. Uh, right now, I've been telling people, you know, and, and we've had guidance issued on this, to uh, class your PPP loan, because that's what it is right now, as a liability on the books until uh, we get additional guidance that says, for example, that it's not going to be taxable and we'll, we'll come up with, um, you know, uh, treatment of that at that point for, for the bookkeeping entry, uh, or that, uh, it is forgiven at which point right now, again, keep in mind, even though Congress originally, uh, passed the law for, uh, the PPP loan to not be taxable, the IRS Department of Treasury has come out and deemed it, um, taxable in the in the sense that it's not included in revenue, but to the extent that you ex, you expended those dollars uh, on on qualified uh, uh, expenditures, then um, you have to offset your salaries, your rent, your utilities to the extent that you paid those items effectively making it taxable. Right. So even though it's not impacting my revenue, 
it is impacting uh, my expenses. And so for now, uh, until we've uh, either been told uh, and issued guidance that uh, it is not taxable or um, that uh, we have obtained forgiveness, we do need to keep that as a liability on the book. So that could be something if you don't have that properly uh, entered right now on your books that could be impacting uh, your year. So, um, so again, going through uh, assets, liabilities, making sure that they make sense, making sure that they tie out. Um, and then, of course, your, your equity, your retained earnings uh, is a roll up of your uh, either contributions, distributions, as well as net income throughout the year. Um, and, and depending on if your tax or gap basis financials, depending on the requirements, you know, we want to make sure that that number uh, ties out. The, one of the easiest ways to identify, uh, for example, for tax basis financials, if, if we're tying out our financials to what's on the tax return, one of the easiest ways for me to identify that we've got a problem is I go look at that uh, AAA account uh, or retained earnings and uh, see if it matches the uh, tax return from the previous year. So um, that is a key indicator, something you want to focus on. Um, but again, I can't stress the importance of going through your balance sheet. The PL is only a function of that. This is the document. This is the uh, asset in your company that you want to make sure is correct. And it's going to help you make uh, a lot better financial decisions by having accurate data here. Um, all right, so we will move on to the P&L. Again, uh, the focus on the um, balance sheet tying out and this will fall into place other than misclassifications, but some key things that you wanna focus on uh, year to year just in analyzing uh, your income statement. And, and again, let me go back to this too. I mean, hopefully you are utilizing something like QuickBooks to capture this information. I mean, some professional services engineering clients that I have may have something other than QuickBooks that they track this information, but you want to be able to accurately pull this information at any given point. And so if you are still operating off of the export my bank account to Excel and try to put it in a format that you can uh, navigate, then it may be time to look at either QuickBooks desktop, QuickBooks online, something that will get you um, to the point where you can put this into a format that you can uh, analyze. And so, um, you know, in this case, uh, this company has a uh, cost of goods sold. And so it's very important, again, for you as a business owner, if you do not understand your cost, then you may not be able to understand what you should charge somebody for your product or service, right? And so if I don't understand my cost, then this gross profit and gross profit percentage uh, is going to tell me, you know, whether or not I'm uh, making money on the uh, original uh, uh, sale of my uh, core business equipment, whatever it is that you're selling. And so uh, look at that. I mean, take your gross profit, divide it by your uh, revenue, and let's see what your gross profit percentage is, because that's, um, you know, going to be important, again, in the sales world, in a construction company or anything else. And you should have a you should have a feel again for what that should look like. So if those percentages are off, then again, hey, I need to ring the bell. We've got a problem. We need to identify what's in these um, financials that's that's not uh, adding up. Again, you're in your business every day. You should know those answers. And so uh, use analytical procedures. Compare uh, these operating expenses like advertising costs and bank charges and cleaning fees, contractors to the prior year. So you can run reports within QuickBooks that gives you a previous year comparison. And if I see that uh, in this uh, fiscal year, my contractor expense was approximately $45,000. Uh, if that last year was 20, then I should know the reason why. Oh yeah, I hired uh, such and such to be a subcontractor, you know, and let's see how that's impacted uh, my bottom line revenue. Um, as well as meals, office supplies, talk about internal controls. If, if I've got an uh, in-house accounting team or an external accounting team that for some reason is doing something fraudulent, oftentimes by analyzing these percentages, uh, I can identify whether or not I've got any fraudulent activity going on. If I've got a lot of debt and I've got very low interest expense, then that's not adding up because the last time I checked, when most people loan me money, they're not willing to give it to me at 0%. So, um, so those are all analytical procedures that I can go through uh, 
uh, and, and kind of, again, tell the story of what's happening in those financial statements. At the end of the year, my payroll expenses, wages should be tying out to what my W-3 or W-2s are telling me that, they, that, that the numbers are. If not, then I've got a problem, okay? Um, you know, analyzing these operating expenses, again, just to reiterate, analytical procedures, uh, those types of um, just monthly reviews, I mean, if, if even quarterly, are going to tell you what's going on uh, in your company and will better prepare you to make decisions and, and uh, analyze cost structure and things like that. So, um, again, if we have questions on either the balance sheet or P&L and things to look at, then um, please feel free to ask those at the end. Um, and we will move now to uh, probably something that people are least familiar with, which is a uh, cash flow management and a cash flow statement. Katie's going to enlighten us uh, as to how that works today. Okay, so we're going to get into cash flow management um, and, and really analyzing your cash flow. And this is super helpful right now as we're in uncertain times. We hear the news that there's a near recession. We're not sure what's going to happen or maybe our business has exploded. We've had several clients um, uh, uh, that have come to us because, uh, because the pandemic caused their business to exponentially grow. And then we've had other clients that have just been trying to keep the doors open. And the cash flow management process is what really helps them navigate and make good choices. Um, and we just have to remember that it's a process. So you don't sit there and just do cash flow analysis and then you're done for the year. Like this is something you need to be looking at at least monthly. Sometimes people are looking at it weekly. So the formula to do this is to look at your cash coming in minus your cash coming out. That's going to equal what cash is left. And then you're going to add the cash that you have on hand. And that's going to give you your current cash position. Now you can do this very easily in a spreadsheet. Um, so I'm gonna go into this one. So this was just one that I did to, uh, for a company that I just made up um, to just give you an idea of how um, e easy it can be um, if you throw it in a spreadsheet. So what you wanna do is you wanna list out the different incomes that, you're, that you have. I did this example um, monthly, but again, you could do it weekly if you wanted to. And you're just going to estimate what your revenues are going to be on a cash basis. Okay, so these are going to be, you're going to look at your invoices and you're going to say, this is what I think I'm going to collect in October. This is what I think I'm going to collect in November and December based on, you know, is it a contract that you can, you're going to be done and you're going to be able to bill. So you're going to be done in October. You're going to bill it October 31st and you've got a 30 day turnaround, a 30 day due date on invoices. Then you could put that into your November that you think you're going to get. If you have a retainer clients, uh, you would just put those if, if they are consistent every single month. Um, you may have some one-time projects that you're doing. Um, and then if you know you're going to get a loan or you have a line of credit, you can um, add that into here to help with the bottom line. Or And I also put an owner injection. So if you're having to put cash into the business to be able to meet payroll or what have you, you would enter it into this line. So that gives you your first part of the formula, which is your total cash in. Then you're gonna look at what your expenses are on a monthly basis and plop those in as well. So I put an owner draw here of um, 500 is what I normally take. And then in December, I'm gonna give myself a thousand to get through Christmas. Um, you may also just have payroll. So most business owners know roughly what their payroll is costs them or runs them in total. So then you would have payroll here and then you would plop in your payroll numbers here. And then you want to just kind of go through all the expenses that are normally on your P&L and uh, put in the cells what you estimate for the year. And you want to make sure that you're remembering. So you're going to have things that are recurring, like your insurance and your rent are recurring. But then you also want to remember those one-time things. So maybe you're paying your accountant at December to look at your numbers before the end of the year. 
And so you want to make sure you estimate that. Now, doing that's going to give you the second part of the equation, the cash flow equation, which is your total expenses. Now, when you're doing this, I want to caution you, you want to be what accountants call conservative. And what we mean when we say conservative is that you're going to estimate your income low and you're going to estimate your expenses high. And that is going to give you kind of your worst case scenario um, as far as your cash is going. So here we've got at the beginning of October, our cat, we looked at what our cash was, it was $1,500. And by the end of October, if, if all these numbers come out correctly, we are gonna have a negative cash flow, which then is going to impact what our cash balance is at the end of the month, okay? So if this number were to, if this number were really big, causing this number to go negative, then that's the point in which we've got to make some choices. And some of the choices may be, do we need to um, really look at increasing sales? Are there some sales leads we haven't followed up on that we need to look at because we really need <clears throat> some cash to come in? Do we need to tighten up our, um, our reminders and um, be, get on the phone and start calling people that are outstanding? Do we need to look at getting a loan or a line of credit with the bank? Or is the owner going to have to put some money in to make ends meet? The other piece, so we can either increase your income by looking at different ways to do that, or we can look at where can we cut costs? Um, you know, can we get away with not putting enough or putting money in to taxes? Not a great idea. That's going to bite you. But maybe this $20 subscription is made up of, you know, Audible and iTunes, and we can get rid of that. Or we can call um, the utility company and ask them to do um, a deferment. So there's different ways you can look at to decrease those. And so what this does is it gives you a snapshot picture of where you're going to be three months from now and whether you're going to run out of money or not. Um, and so that can be really helpful um, as far as determining whether you want to make big purchases, whether you want to hire a new employee, um, or whether you, you need to cut back your staff. Maybe the only way to make this positive is to reduce your payroll by, um, by a full-time employee. Um, sometimes you've got to make the hard decisions to make ends meet. Um, or maybe it's time to really start looking at different bank loans to help you get through um, a potential down, down period. So it, this is also really helpful for, um, for clients of mine that are very cyclical in nature. Um, maybe their business follows the school year, um, and so they see a significant dip in revenues during the summer. Um, maybe they have a lot of um, legislature clients or state business um, where they do big conferences or they're really busy during session um, as opposed to other times of the year. So that's when this really becomes helpful is when you've got those ebbs and flows of revenue to really look at this. Um, do you have anything to add on cash flow, Andrew? Yeah, no, I mean, I think you did a great job just that, you know, for the business owner out there looking at creating one of these for the first time, as Katie said, in the estimation, we need to try to be accurate. Again, the, the, the key word is cash inflows and cash outflows. So it's not going to be this $150,000 that I'm hoping to get paid. You know, maybe it's drug out six months. That's not something that I want to add in until I'm sure that I'm receiving that in that month, because then that's completely thrown off the analysis. So this is different than accrual. This is we want to we want to identify the cash we are actually going to collect within these monthly periods. Right. And the other thing that I just saw that I had written in my notes was to also look at um, maybe uh, cash inflows that may decrease due to the time of year or what's going on in your business. So if you're planning on taking a big vacation in July or December, everybody's off for two weeks, or you're going to do a big um, company-wide training in March, 
those, those months may not have the cash inflow um, that you're normally looking at. So you don't want to just put in the exact same amount every single month and be counting on that. You want to also look at what's going on in my business each month that may cause it to go up or to go down. And then real briefly, I just wanted to go back to the balance sheet slide. Um, there was there was something I wanted to point out. I have a, I, I have this like vision in my head of people going to their accountants after they hang up and being like, run me a balance sheet. One thing you wanna look at, which is a big deal, is if this total assets number um, if this total assets number doesn't equal this liabilities number, that's a problem, okay? If you see anything here that says uncategorized assets, that's a problem. And the other one you wanna be mindful of is this payroll liabilities. Payroll liabilities means that that money's been taken out of people's payroll checks and need to be going somewhere. Um, whether it's to the state or to the feds or to the health insurance payment, um, this you, you want to have a good understanding of those numbers. Those would be my top three things if I pulled a balance sheet that I'd be looking at. So that being said, uh, I don't know how to lose my little, there you go. Okay, so what do we do now? All right. So uh, action items here. Uh, and again, I know we're running short on time and we want to make sure we have time for questions. So we'll kind of go through this quickly, but call your CPA or if you don't have one, consider hiring one. Call me or another CPA, you know, in town uh, and, and, and establish that relationship. Uh, ask your bookkeeper for the most recent P&L balance sheets. Uh, ask questions. Talk about some of the questions uh, that we discussed today. And then, of course, if you haven't ever try to cash flow projection and try one uh, for fun this weekend. Uh, I know that's exactly how you want to spend your time, but, but seriously, this stuff's important. We need to, uh, as business owners, take it seriously and make sure that you have a good understanding of that. So again, we'll, we'll kind of move forward so that we can uh, see if there are any questions. Well, Andrew, there are, I did see one in the chat. Um, so Philip Browning asks, would you advise clients to hold off on applying for forgiveness and hopes of more guidance rolling out from the SBA? Yes, I think that is uh, certainly a prudent point, Philip, and one that we have uh, advised most of our clients on as well. well if you if are, you are, if there is a, a reason for you to apply early, then, then certainly, um, you know, we need to do that and consider that. Uh, otherwise, if you are under that $150,000 threshold, then there's a very good opportunity that you, or a possibility that you could have the opportunity for forgiveness without applying. Now, if we continue to go down this road with Congress and nothing else additionally comes out, then um, then we may want to go ahead and consider applying, even if we are under the $150,000. And again, I mentioned too, if you're if you're $50,000 or less, you've got that one page uh, forgiveness application that's come out. That's pretty simple. It may be worth doing that. And then uh, the last is um, if you are over that $150,000 threshold, odds are we may not uh, get the opportunity for blanket forgiveness. So if you've gone past your 24 weeks, then we may want to go ahead and consider preparing that. Any other questions? Yeah. So, well, one, um, Katie in the chat, Rick Oppenheim, um, sings your praises. Um, wanted to give a <laughs> testimonial because um, you are his bookkeeper. So make sure to look at that if you haven't already. Thank um, you. And, and then another question we have, please review the three red flags you look for on a balance sheet. Um, and equities between total asset liabilities, payroll liability, and what else? Oh, uh, the third was, oh, looking for anything called uncategorized assets. Yeah, and just and just to add, so the the equation in the financial statement, total assets equals e liabilities and equity. Okay, so the the liabilities and your equity section should add up to equal your total assets. So that's that's the formula there that that you need to pay attention to. Well, I'll give it just another second. There aren't any other questions right now, but sometimes I know that it takes a minute for them to populate and come through. 
But um, great segue in this slide. Um, you guys can see um, Katie and Andrew's contact information here. Um, again, we have the slides and we will be exporting the recording. So we will send those out to everyone who was registered today as well. And um, if you guys, I think that's, I think we'll call it. It's 9.33, so cognizant of everyone's time. Um, Andrew, Katie, thank you very much. That's great info. Um, and again, thank you to Leon Cares and thank you to Capital Health Plan for sponsoring today. Um, we hope that you guys will check out the remaining two in our business recovery series. Um, we're going to be talking marketing communications next, and then we're going to end with strategic planning and visioning. So um, you guys will be able to prepare for 2021. Um, again, thank you for joining us. And um, if you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Stay safe, be well, and we hope to see you all soon. Have a great day.